I just want to introduce myself, everyone. Thank you again for tuning in. My name is Steven. I am the community outreach director for the LBCA. Um, and I have my brother, Nate, right here. And I'll let him introduce himself. But thank you all for tuning in. Hey, guys. Good evening. Hope everybody's having a good Tuesday. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Uh, my name's Nate. I am the VP uh, for Bell Costa Labs. We're one of the testing labs in the state. We also hold education, cannabis education in the highest regard, and we've started doing these classes again. This isn't our first set of rodeos. We've been doing these classes in conjunction with the LBCA for a little while now. And uh, thank you guys all for joining. So anyhow, my name's Nate. Thank you for coming to the second installment. This is what we would call 101B for the uh, LBCA Cannabis 101 through 106 courses that we're throwing. Uh, there are a total of eight classes there. Uh, we will be going as long as we essentially can. This first set of classes right here will be uh, totaling over a course of, I believe, 16 weeks. So over a course of the next four months or, you know, subsequent three and a half months or so. A total of eight classes and we do have a couple of specialized events uh, in mind and some uh, overall uh, sort of like community builders in mind should this COVID-19 thing go away with regards to what the coming months are. We'll see when it goes. But to everybody and especially if this is your first class, we'll be discussing the following. That's the cannabis product knowledge, history, local and global. That was mainly last week where we covered all cultural and uh, history, historic knowledge pretty much worldwide. And then uh, closer and closer to nowadays and uh, ultimately covered right up to the current culture uh, in Long Beach. Um, we've also got bud tending. That'll be the next class that we're doing. Manufacturing is coming up, distribution, cultivation will be coming up, specializations in science and cannabis will be coming up. We'll be covering all sorts of things. You can also see that based on, you know, basic stuff like history, it's a little bit more complex like cannabis products this week, moving up to uh, retail bud tender style training next class. You can see that we're starting, oh, and then following that manufacturing, you can see we're getting more and more complex. What that essentially means is that sticking to these classes will have a payoff. We'll be taking a lot of these concepts that we're kind of creating a foundation on and we'll be building it up and building it up. And ultimately the goal will be that if you are a professional, you'll see this as a baseline to where other professionals may speak about these same concepts or these same sort of topics in the same way. And that would be glory for me. I want to be able to create those baselines. If nothing else, then everybody simply calls the same fucking products by the same names that would be an absolute success here in our world with that much said the more of a baseline I have the opportunity to help the uh, industry create the community create to where we're actually able to say and show what these things are and who they and to describe them all the same way which if any of you I'm sure all of you have been to a dispensary you know that you might get different descriptions at some dispensaries of the same product by different people and that's just not something that can fly. And so by creating these baselines, these common terms and these ideas, it's in my opinion, super worthwhile. First though, a little bit of a shameless plug on my lab. That's us, that's Bell Costa Labs. That's who we are. And uh, this week uh, is our, let me look at my calendar here. Uh, yeah, this week right here, this Thursday is our two year anniversary. So thank you guys, thank you community for uh, making us essentially of all the new labs, we're, we're kind of the one that's got the biggest spotlight and we really appreciate that. And so obviously it comes along with a lot of knowledge. Feel free to read through as I also give a shout out to a shout out to my friend Stephen and the LBCA. Uh, LBCA is essentially the uh, organization that's made all of this happen. Uh, they're this is massive, these efforts that are undertaken and uh, really stands out across the country as one of the strongest community cannabis associations out there. And so if you can give Stephen a shout out, I and mean, this is, you know, among his and his, uh, his team, it's their baby. And uh, they've been, you know, creating something that the industry's, you know, in my opinion, never seen before. So massive ups to them. 
Yeah, Enough definitely. about all that fun stuff. Yeah, no, you know, you guys deserve it. Definitely Enough want to give a shout out to, um, to the LBCA board. And honestly, the LBCA, as it says right there, we're a nonprofit trade association. We are comprised of all of the legal and licensed business operators in the city. Together, we act as one voice to move cannabis policy, community, and education. And thank you, Nate, for partnering with us. And I think everyone's really excited to get into 101. Our 101B. So here we go. So this class is to familiarize or, again, create baselines with different various cannabis products and their means of delivery. We'll also be covering a lot of differences between well-made products and ineffective harmful ones. Uh, things like different product types, different types of hardware, regulated products versus illegal. Uh, and then I'm going to start to introduce cannabis product testing, what we do, uh, because the whole idea of what makes something safe versus not safe has become a massive area of focus and a massive topic for a lot of different channels in recent years, especially with the whole rollout of the regulated market and something that we absolutely need to talk about. So we have different product types. And that's what we're going to get into first. I can no reason to go through the list. You'll see these all in just a moment. There will be a few different types of crossover products that I understand I won't get to. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, any opportunities uh, to come in, of course, we'll be asking questions at the end. Uh, but if there's anything quick that you can throw out through chat or, you know, we'll be watching that and uh, we'll be, you know, trying to be as helpful as possible. If something really is burning, feel free to jump off mute and, uh, and let me know what's on your mind. Raw cannabis flower, native form of cannabis, typically dried and cured. Everybody with me? Strain specific also includes CBD and THC ratios. Now, this is important because that's a classification for a lot of uh, products. That's also kind of a difficult ratio to hit, especially if you consider that whole 10% labeling requirement that California has. It means that something can't be a one more than a 1.1 to 1 and still be considered by that same type of name. Sorry if you guys can hear my little one in the background. That's uh, him letting me know that he needs attention. Strain specific also includes CBD THC ratios. What we have there are anything from one to ones, two to ones, and so forth. But more appropriately, means of classification based on the chemical, uh, based on the chemical profiles of these types of products. And those chemical profiles having a, a uh, position in being able to uh, define what these products ultimately are is huge. And being able to define products chemically is very, very much of a future way that this industry is going. Also bear in mind that the archaic morphology system, which we're talking about indica versus sativa, is likely going to continue going away. Bear in mind that there are, and I've, I don't have it uh, readily available, but there's recently been a fairly large news article that uh, further debunked Indica versus Sativa, uh, further pointing out the multiple misnomers and all of that uh, not so fun stuff. Uh, there are a lot of issues with the whole indica versus sativa, but namely that cannabis doesn't just follow that dichotomy of sleepy to awake. It's much more complex than that. It can be creative. It can be energetic in different ways. It can be relaxing versus uh, a sedative in different ways. And so being able to go beyond what we would just call an indica sativa versus a cross between them can be much better explained by things like the chemical profile, not just cannabinoids, but the terpene profile oh, yeah. as well. Not sure if you guys are familiar with decarboxylation versus, uh, well, raw product. Uh, well, it's not the best way to put it. You could talk about active or decarboxylated cannabinoids versus raw cannabinoids. If we're talking about raw cannabis flower, it's full of raw cannabinoids that have not yet been decarboxylated. Decarb process usually happens through heat. And with regards to raw cannabis flower, usually happens when you light it on fire, smoke it through your pipe, joint, whatever have you. We're looking at, uh, it can be juiced as a fresh plant. That is something that's very much a part of, oh, excuse me, I skipped forward. That's something that's very much a part of the uh, home grows at this point. I really can't juice or render anything 
that can then be used on a dispensary level right now. Being able to juice cannabis, however, has uh, been able to show uh, uh, beating things like uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. You use a hell of a lot of cannabis. Uh, people generally regard that you'd be going through about a plant a day in order to get a full juice regimen. Uh, it would be full of rock cannabinoids as per the previous point, and it's extremely effective digestively speaking. See, these plants, mainly THC-bearing plants, have in the raw form a bunch of uh, THCA, bunches and bunches of this chemical. THCA, while it doesn't really get you high, may decarboxylate a little bit in your body, it doesn't really get you to the point where uh, necessarily that would be the benefit. The main benefit would be the, the anti-inflammatory qualities of THCA. With that come massive benefits through juicing. And that's one of the benefits we have here. Uh, total terpene profile. I'm going to try to balance a few profiles as I move through, but something to bear in mind, uh, you can see something from very dry to natural terpene profiles up to about 5%, although that doesn't generally happen very often. Pre-rolls. Cannabis flowers often ren rendered into pre-roll joints. Everybody's pretty much there. They can be blended or single strain in packs or in singles. Uh, they may be enhanced with keef hash or hash oil. In fact, there's not really that many restrictions for most companies to uh, keep them from doing infused joints. And I think we're going to see more and more infused joints, um, hopefully for the betterment, uh, coming on the market in the future. Uh, High-end pre-rolls are available as cannabis cigars. Not sure if you guys have seen these, but these easily hit the hundreds range, one to 200 commonly. And I've even heard of some, some cases where they're much more than that. Uh, these high-end pre-rolls are uh, they're something to behold. They definitely burn for a while and uh, are one of the more exceptional ones in the cannabis cigar category. Uh, avoid dry pre-roll products uh, is a general lesson out there. There are a lot of products that one could say are a lot of cannabis that is fleshed out or disguised as not the best cannabis in pre-rolls and uh, one does want to be savvy and, and aware of those. It just generally doesn't equal a good experience uh, to the next point where flavor does not always equal to better. Um, you could compare this to things like alcohol where nobody takes the best whiskey or scotch and flavors it with cinnamon. You know, you got to go to fireball for stuff like that. So if you're seeing something that's flavored and not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, in the same range as you may normally go, uh, it is meant worth mentioning that that might not be on the same range of product that you're looking for. Vapes are where it starts to get into a little bit more of a technical range. Uh, cannabis oil is often loaded into vape cartridges. We know that. These e-cigarettes, these are e-cigarettes modified for cannabis. A lot of the technology started from tobacco, and it's worth mentioning that some of the poor, uh, uh, some of the poor hardware still very much replicate that kind of tobacco work. It doesn't do for, it doesn't do very much uh, justice to the product. Uh, convenient entry point, though, still for many customers, for many consumers. Um, it is very straightforward and there are a lot of high-end cartridges. There is a lot of high-end oil that's out there. Although we all kind of know that vapes taken a hit, especially in the last, say, six to eight months where we saw that whole Vaporgate thing happening. Uh, it's worth mentioning that, you know, there are certain care points that we have if you do want to maintain vapes. Keeping it in your pocket probably isn't the best idea. Keeping it in temperature controlled area where it doesn't rise and where it doesn't rise and fall, the temperature that is, is probably a great idea for, for storage. Little stuff like that can help to bump this whole experience and make it a little bit more uh, palatable, palatable for, uh, for everybody. 
uh, imperfect technology, some contamination issues, uh, especially present on poor cartridges and what we're talking about largely is lead contamination. Uh, poor cartridges especially, we'll see a level of corrosion and breakdown. We'll see within that level of breakdown, uh, lead leaching into the oil. And when we test for it very frequently, we'll see levels many times unsafe levels of lead inside of those products, at which point obviously they fail. Uh, product lines are broadening with saucepans. Uh, saucepans are interesting, good, inter good, uh, good step in the recombinant product direction and uh, using all cannabis to help flavor products, I think is something that a lot of us can get behind, especially with regards to some of the uh, uh, poorly flav flavored products that used to be in the industry and trying to get away from those. So total terpene profile, although do bear in mind in a lot of senses, this can be a, that based on a recombinant product can be anywhere from zero to 15%. Next, we've got inhalable dabs, guys. Now hash oil may be vaporized or smoked through special devices designed to for this very purpose. Uh, not a big surprise there, right? Valuable chemicals are concentrated, shelf life is increased, and inert plant products are removed. So just to kind of cover all of that. Valuable chemicals are concentrated. Now there are more chemicals in there than just cannabinoids and terpenes, but those are the best indicators we have to be able to show that high quality chemicals have been concentrated. Shelf life is increased. We've taken out certain components of that uh, product that have the opportunity to rot or grow uh, some type of microbial life faster that may not uh, necessarily be in the direction that we want to keep for the sake of maintaining high-end product. It's also worth mentioning that in its concentrated form, the product tends to stay in a high-end, um, that's not a right way to put it, I apologize. The product tends to stay um, in a more of a consistent condition uh, under the right storage conditions. If we're talking about concentrates such as dabs, we're talking about things like being able to keep them in a refrigerator while they're not being used. And in that sense, uh, concentrate, say kept in a refrigerator, would not nearly um, break down at the rate that say flour would be at the same rate. You could come back to that flour Hour, a year later and it won't really be worth smoking. You could come back to that concentrate a year later and it likely will not have changed very much. Inert plant products are removed. Pretty straightforward, but something to think about. We're taking a lot of parts of the plant that don't belong as something that we ought to smoke and we're taking them out of the equation. Different qualities impacted by the state of the starting material and processing methods slash conditions. So this is something to uh, bear in mind. The uh, different qualities that we have in this product um, impacted again by the state of the starting material is a humongous component of what actually makes a product worth smoking or not. So much of it has to do with the starting material. What never essentially happens is taking something that's trash and turning it into something that's absolutely worth uh, high-end dollar smoking uh, based on its condition. Uh, generally spoken, something that's pretty old is going to go into, assuming it's extracted, is likely going to go through a high efficiency extraction process, could be a type of butane extraction, could be ethanol extraction, could be a CO2, there are a lot of steps. And it'll likely be distilled at the end of its uh, production life in order to be able to be pushed to the next step, uh, being the uh, either infusion into edibles or being able to be made into vape pens. Um, higher quality stuff, you do want to process differently. You want to take less steps to process high quality stuff. You want to control temperature uh, through much more of a sensitive system uh, or systems. And the overall uh, impact of what the different types of extraction hardware are, depending on the starting material and depending on how good of a job it is of being extracted or kept, is really what separates something from the high-end stuff versus the not. Solvent-made and solventless products are marketed. It's worth mentioning a lot of solventless products use water hash extraction in their method. Water is a solvent. I, I get what they're saying, but you know, it's still solvent. 
Solventless products and the like are very much worth mentioning. Uh, it's something that's made through a means that is uh, used to, uh, intended to use something that is uh, only going to be a safe method. And it's to suggest that if there is any uh, residual left inside of that type of product, that we're really only looking at healthy chemicals. CO2 extract, even if one were to say carbon dioxide be around that product, which of course there will be carbon dioxide around that product, it's not gonna be harmful, not on that small scale. And so while CO2 might not be personally uh, the extraction type that I would say um, would uh, necessarily be the most ideal for a high-end extraction. It's certainly one that doesn't run into the same solvent contamination issues that other types of products might. We can go on in that and there will be other classes where we bring in uh, even different manufacturers of these different products and they'll be able to even give you that heads up as to exactly why they're going to be suggesting that they use one of these products versus another. Non-inhalable edibles. So this is something worth mentioning that there's a non-inhalable and non-inhalable is worth uh, only stating in that that's what the state calls them. So there are three categories in the eyes of the state. There are flower, inhalable, and non-inhalable. Inhalables are concentrates, smokable concentrates. Non-inhalables are everything else that aren't a concentrate, a smokable concentrate or a flower. And so we have non-inhalable edibles, non-inhalable infused, just as terms that the state uses. So we try to replicate some of those in the class. Um, Any cannabis can be infused into food and tincture products. No humongous surprise there, right? But unlike smoking, edibles may have a slow onset. And that's interesting. We have the opportunity to do something called self-titrating. You know, it's a, just a term that you're going to hear mentioned elsewhere in the class. But a self titration or self titrating is an act of being able to say smoke your medicine, and you're able to the way it works is I take a hit and I'm not high, and I take another hit and I'm almost high, and then I take a third hit and I'm high enough, and then I put the pipe down, and that's how self titration works. It's as simple as that. So something that has the opposite type of way of looking at it, edibles, is something worth mentioning that it uh, has a different titration method that can actually apply to this. Um, the best way to take edibles and not suffer from them is to titrate upward. And even if you don't start from 10 milligrams, the idea is still the same where you start from 10 milligrams one week, 20 milligrams the week following, 30 milligrams the week after that, and so on and so forth. And you guys pretty much get the idea. And that, can, so that idea is considered up titration. When you do that, there's almost no way to go wrong. And when you consider the unfortunate souls that have to take thousands and thousands of milligrams per day, that equates to multiple grams of oil of concentrate eaten just to be able to maintain the kind of conditions that one may have under unfortunate conditions such as epilepsy, cancer, and so forth, we have the opportunity to see um, the uh, need for titration going upwards because there's no way somebody can start with thousands of milligrams right out the gate. They'd be blown for a week. Uh, so in those kind of cases, it plays an extremely uh, strong uh, well, it, it's very much necessary to, to, you know, bear that in mind and to work with that. Um, next, maximum serving in California and other places, very much like, um, well, we've got Colorado, we've got uh, Washington. Now, we've got different areas that have, you know, maximum serving of 10 milligrams. Why do, why are 10 milligrams a maximum serving? Why is it 100 milligrams per product max? Because it's pretty safe for the state to stand behind. If they say that there was one serving and that one serving is 10 milligrams, then they're suggesting something that should be very low. I've heard a lot of people say that 10 milligrams is perfect for them, in which case more power to that system. I personally think that in these kind of communities, you generally don't see anything significant for most people until about 20, 25 milligrams in dose. But to, to suggest 10 milligrams is really just kind of throttling everything and keeping a little bit of a control on those types of products. 
Then we've got CBD rich products playing a strong role. That would have uh, variants of it like 20 to 1 and other areas of being able to observe these ratio-based systems that have kind of chemically started identifying cannabis. Uh, we also have microdosing versus macro dosing that also exists in the edibles world. Microdosing, there are different definitions that I've heard of this. Anything that can range from one to five milligrams per day to one to five milligrams per week. And you guys may have heard different versions of this, but that's what people would generally consider microdosing. Macro dosing, I see things from, you know, such as taking thousands of milligrams to help alleviate certain issues. Uh, I've even seen milligrams times pounds equal total number of milligrams. So I've heard of considerations. Nice, Stephen. So I've heard of considerations where uh, you have something like 10 milligrams for something like an unfortunate cancer patient, 10 milligrams per pound for that patient. So 10 milligrams of say THCA or 10 milligrams of a CBD blend per pound, which for somebody like me would be, you know, not quite 2000 milligrams per day, but you know, obviously up there. So we're talking about something that's pretty significant. So that's something that we all kind of have to bear in mind as uh, the kind of baselines that may exist for the large side and the low side of what we call edibles. Often full of sugars, eating extracts is a high dose alternative. So what am I talking about there, guys? Often full of sugar. I can answer that pretty well. Cannabis doesn't taste good in its concentrated form, especially. Um, it's pretty bitter, but in its defense, most plant extracts that you just throw in large amounts into products would be pretty bitter. It's just how it works. The way of uh, backing out a bitter flavor from products is to add sugar to it. And that's why traditionally cannabis products have been all sugar. That's it. You know, nothing more complex than that. That's kind of just how it's always sort of worked. Eating extracts is a high dose alternative. So here's a situation. I've had a stomach ache. I've had some hash that I hadn't smoked yet. And I took that hash, I take maybe about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 grams. I roll it into a little ball and I eat it. And it makes me feel great. The reason is, is because hash is a water extraction. That means it doesn't decarboxylate or activate, which means you're eating raw cannabinoids. In this case, you're likely eating THCA if you were to do the same thing. Eating THCA, well, that's a potent anti-inflammatory. And I just sent it to my digestive system where there are receptors for cannabis. And through these receptors, we have the opportunity to... Hey, Ishka. Hi. Got any... Did I leave my pre-roll in there? Uh, there may be pre-rolls in here. You're welcome to check. Mm, but, I don't see them. It's okay. But you Bye, can wave guys. to everybody. Take good care. Um, for our... We have multiple studios going on here tonight, guys. Um, where was I? Ah, found it. Okay, so eating extracts is a high-dose alternative. Let's say, and just to give you a little bit of quick math, I have some hash, and let's say it's just 50%. That's an easy, that's easy math. Let's say if I started with one gram of 50% hash, it would be 500 milligrams. You know how I figure that out? Is I know it has 50% THC in it, and I know if there's one gram and 50% of that gram is THC, because that's how that number works. If half of that weight, half of that thousand milligrams, which is a gram, is THC, I know 500 milligrams in half a gram, I know there would be 100 milligrams in the 10th, or excuse me, 50 milligrams, I mean, in a 10th of a gram, which means if I have 0.2, let's say for the sake of this riddle, 0.3 grams, what we're looking at, is 150 milligrams because there would be 50, gra uh, 50 milligrams times 0.1 grams. And that's, you know, 0.3 grams that we're, uh, we're, that we're talking about. 150 milligrams rolled up into a ball 
would be 150 milligrams of THCA expressed directly towards the uh, cannabinoid receptors in my digestive system. That's massive. That does so much for your body. And trust me, if you have something like a sour stomach, that's actually a magnificent way to be able to treat it with cannabis. Now, the reason why you wouldn't want to just straight up eat the ganj is because that's a lot, and I mean a fucking lot, of insoluble fiber, way more than you generally should have. And that equals a stomach ache. So the idea of a concentrate, again, being a means of having removed a lot of those inert plant products, thrown them away. Now you have only a small amount of the active ingredient left over. <coughs> Excuse me only that small amount. And that can be in this topic, be digested. And that's something that can be used to treat yourself. Kind of amazing, kind of interesting, something that everybody, in my opinion, should be aware of. Also in the non-inhalable category, we have topicals. How am I doing on time? All right, I could be going faster. Sorry, guys, I'm going to start running through it. Cannabis topical application is very widespread. Applications include healing, painkilling, and anti-inflammation. Now, topicals are a certain ROA or route of administration. We're going to talk more about ROAs as we go on in the class, but it is worth mentioning that it's that this ROA is not exclusive. If you are willing to ingest cannabis or smoke cannabis is not exclusive to another ROA. There can be different routes of administration. Hell, you can use a topical smoke and take an edible to combat the same issue and with a very chosen specific cannabinoid or overall chemical regimen as you're trying to can combat that, that issue. Odds are you'll feel like a million bucks. And so that is a little bit of the therapeutic power of cannabis, kind of with regards to this overall circle being closed. Applications include, oh, we did that, sorry. <laughs> Large variation in formulations from balms to lotions to bath balms to, in my opinion, uh, very underdosed stuff to very appropriately dosed stuff. In my opinion, though, you should be looking at the milligrams on the container. Uh, most applications ought to be using 10 plus milligrams. And personally speaking, for some of the pain treatment that I have you know, put together for myself, I've had to make my own balms and lotions because I'll use sometimes upwards of 30 to 50 milligrams in a single use. So that's worth mentioning that you would need a little button of product because generally spoken, you don't get that many milligrams total in an overall product. And so something bigger doesn't always necessarily for those high pain patients or high pain uh, consumers in these days, doesn't necessarily mean that it would necessarily be or that it would always be the right application. There's a large, uh, wait, wait, I'm one behind guys. Sorry. High dosage is often necessary for significant results covered. Many tinctures may be used externally as well as internally. In fact, the old school definition of a tincture, especially an ethanol tincture, uh, is that it could be used uh, you know, in multiple areas of the body. The same can be said of something that has been uh, infused into an oil medium. So, you know, oil and ethanol tinctures are both extremely valuable. Uh, because, you know, considering the versatility in terms of dosage and uh, being able to affect, uh, you know, mix well, of course, you know, shake well. Safe and common entry point for a large number of consumers. There are a lot of people in my family, for instance, that won't even imagine smoking and uh, may someday consider edibles, but absolutely will consider a topical. And uh, with some good reason, uh, there's really no interaction between that and your bloodstream. And uh, you know, really, we're talking about most people would believe uh, interaction is really only with receptors close to the surface that's able to uh, be, you know, helped through uh, cannabis uh, treatment. And uh, that's, that's, you know, a, definitely an effective ROA. Specialized variations can be crazy. Um, so the first one right there, hash, inf hash oil infused rolling papers. We've seen some of these like lift tickets and stuff like that. Uh, but do consider the fourth one down there, the hash rolling cone. That's what's there in front. And that's taken at my good friend Matt's house. Um, so that was back in the 215 days. And looks like I have some Jungle Boy stuff right there too. Um, so that is actually a blunt wrap 
but it doesn't have any tobacco leaf. That's just a, a cone of hash. And um, when you toked it, like when you chiefed it too hard, it would catch fire spontaneously. So it was like one of the most entertaining joints. You just, you know, got to be careful about, you know, wearing a flat bill cap. Um, suppositories, that's a type of infused product, usually infused into an oil medium. Uh, although I do see um, various types of uh, therapies uh, delivered through that ROA. Um, dissolving oil strips, uh, that's something that you would take obviously in the kind of spirit of like uh, a Listerine freshman uh, strip. Hash rolling cone, we saw that. Terpene extractions like Blue River, uh, obviously crazy stuff right there. Moon rocks types of products. Uh, there you see very often a uh, flower dressed with oil and then rolled in keef and uh, creates almost like this egg of doom that you know you pick apart and it obviously has all of these different components to it and it's tested with you know regards to being a concentrated product as, as obviously as we test it so our lab is you know testing it for things like butane and stuff like that as well even though it appears to be more like a nug kind of style product so different types of vape inhalation hardware. Um, so a lot of these everybody's going to be familiar with. I'm just going to jump right into it, guys. So vape hardware has taken many different forms over the years, from whip styles, volcanoes, and vape pens. That top one right there, whip style, that's a hotbox vaporizer, if anybody remembers those. And whip styles are still out there. It's something that you do run into, and they're, they're, they're effective. You know, it's not always how I would... Uh, personally prefer my my product but they absolutely have their pet place and they're a great entry-level product for a lot of people especially elderly people who wouldn't normally smoke cannabis all applications have the same goals of vaporizing the valuable chemicals without combustion which is to mention to everybody real quick if you've ever heard of distilling cannabis this is a very way over basic way to put it but if you ever wondered how that works do imagine that if you can vaporize the cannabinoids well then you can also condense and cool them very much like water and although that's a gross oversimplification when you hear terms like cannabis distillate or distilled cannabis often that's what somebody's talking about or referring to or to what they're referring uh, most applications now are single purchase hardware solutions we're seeing a lot of one-time use pens and we're also seeing lots of one-time use cartridges most common applications are vape pens, also including the disposable elements, of course. And then vaporizer hardware exists for both extracts and flour. And you can see the various photos there on the side. Uh, down below the hot box, we've got a volcano. Everybody knew somebody who had a volcano and who wouldn't shut up about their volcano. But uh, it's, it was a point of pride. They were not uh, inexpensive and they were crazy. Uh, that one on the bottom is called a launch box. Uh, or a magic flight. I think you can find it under both names. And uh, that was a really uh, interesting minimalistic one. If anybody here is ever into vaporizing, uh, look at that one. It's really interesting, especially if you're that, you know, kind of minimalist, like, you know, very few things, but it works great kind of thing. That's uh, one of those. Dab hardware. Dab setups are more complex, but offer much more richness and temperature control and quality pro product. <laughs> Sorry. Much more complex, but offer much more richness and temperature control and quality products through which to experience different temp points. So what are we looking at talking about there? We're talking about how you can vaporize these products and often the temperature is something relevant. Why is the temperature relevant? Well, dab products, people want them to taste good. And a lot of these flavors will volatize at certain temperatures that aren't necessarily that high. If you ever hear somebody taking a low temp dab, it means they're trying to target more of those flavor causing chemicals like the terpenes, but there are others in there besides terpenes. Uh, but many of those flavor causing chemicals and you're trying to target them more so than the cannabinoids. 
if you said fuck it and you crank the temperature all the way up there, what you would end up seeing is that you would end up uh, closer to, let's say at about six, 650, right in that range, you're looking at a temperature where you're going to be absolutely vaporizing those cannabinoids. Those terpenes aren't given nearly as much care and sensitivity and you won't get as much of a low temperature uh, you know, a flavorful experience if you were to do that high temperature dab. And that's the whole kind of idea between different temp points. Are you trying to target the cannabinoids which burn high at a higher temperature and won't taste as good, but still worthwhile? Or are you trying to target the, um, the uh, flavor causing chemicals such as the terpenes less so than the cannabinoids, but still worthwhile, still going to get you high, just targeted differently based on the heat, and hence you'll have a different experience. Most dab hardware includes a heating element or blowtorch, a tool for handling the oil, such as, check out the Sherbert pencil, or a specialized pipe and accessories and a cap to manipulate the airflow, such as, well, this is really convenient doing this at home. I can really just kind of show all of this stuff. So often you'll see something like a banger. Banger will have a cap that goes on top. Man, I let it get dirty after that last hit. Sorry, people, you're supposed to keep it cleaner than this. That is what gets torched from the bottom. You can see something called turp pearls in the bottom. And if you can check the little kind of double helix sort of look of the uh, cap, that spins those little balls around and uh, kind of catches uh, all of the product with regards to maximizing the surface area. When it comes to high efficiency smoking for cannabis, a lot of it is about surface area, not just the surface area of the heat contacting the uh, product as I demonstrated there with regards to that spinny cap kind of deal, but also with regards to the smoke contacting the water. If you ever wonder why your down stem or where it touches the water has so many holes and, or slits, it's to cut down on the size of those bubbles. More small bubbles versus one big bubble equals more surface area. More surface area through uh, more small bubbles means that you're seeing more contact with the smoke in the water. That means it's cooling down your product more and it has more of a chance to filter. You improve the efficacy of the water through that means and that's just fucking beautiful. So moving on. Electric heating is becoming increasingly common and options now exist with convection, conduction, and induction heating methods, which is absolutely mind-blowing as well. There are also probes that can be used to tell you what temperature your banger uh, or otherwise smoking product is and can be used to also control the temperature of one's head. Used to exclusively smoke, quote, full melt products, unquote, with no trace of solid plant matter. That means that when you're taking a dab, whatever is, you know, the idea is that virtually nothing will be left and certainly no chunks of solid plant matter. It should be in that sense considered a full melt type of product. Next, necessary for raw flour, smoking accessories. Oh, excuse me, smoking accessories at the top. Necessary for raw flour, herb grinder. This is of course my own silly opinion, but uh, if you've ever used a grinder, a good one, odds are extremely, extremely strong that you've never gone back, you've never left home without it, so on and so forth. Having a good high quality grinder, especially if you're in the US, a US made grinder is absolutely paramount. You should use one. It absolutely impro improves the experience through none other than improving surface area. Now, I just mentioned that a moment ago, but it's fucking true. It's absolutely huge. And the opportunity to improve that surface area to get a more efficient smoke is, again, paramount. Um, they, I have seen certain blunt rolling uh, uh, techniques, which absolutely in the most specialized of ways require hand-picked you know, weed, but we'll get to those later. Keef traps are specialized prep areas. If you ever have the opportunity to prep your uh, cannabis on any kind of a specialized area, a tray, keef trap, anything like that, please do that. Uh, over anything porous really doesn't do you or your cannabis any favors. Uh, cleaning solvents and tools. Uh, cleaning solvents uh, would normally be things like rubbing alcohol before it was impossible to 
effing find. Uh, but things like that, uh, limonene, uh, that's actually a terpene that you find in cannabis. Limonene is a fantastic cleaning cleaner. And there are all sorts of other interesting cleaners out there. Again, if you have any comments, feel free to drop any, any that you may have in there questions of, and I'll do my best to let you know. I personally use alcohol and when necessary salt, but I just use warm alcohol. Grevo sticks and hemp line. There's some uh, pretty hippy dippy stuff right there. Grevo sticks are glass sticks that you would use something like a blowtorch to heat up the end of a stick. That stick would then be used to light your cannabis. Now there are certain specialized methods like you see over there on the right with the regards to that photo where you can see a Grevo stick. You can see up on the top right hand corner it's been used and obviously heated up by the blowtorch there and then dip down into that bowl. But wait, there's something very peculiar about that bowl. What we're looking at is what's considered an old school uh, concentrate or hash smoking bowl. Now, what you have there is no hole in the bottom. So using a regular conventional lighter on that is a fruitless effort. It will avoid the product at the bottom of the bowl and the heat and the light and the gas from the lighter will just travel down those holes that are raised above that. That's specifically for product that you're going to jam that Grevo stick on. It's going to liquefy and that liquefied product is going to vaporize, rise up. That vapor is going to rise up and disappear through those holes. It's an absolutely insane, you know, piece, but obviously it's a ton of work too. And you know, all that fun stuff. But when this is all over, hit me up guys, we'll smoke out of it. So it's kind of fun. Anyhow, um, smell proof and travel gear. Uh, I travel with cannabis probably more than I should be mentioning. Um, so uh, I recommend strongly having things like smell proof gear and things like that uh, absolutely gets me out of a lot of binds uh, and things like smell proof bags too, totally uh, indispensable. Metal and glass screens. I'm talking about the screens at the bottom of products. Now I'm a huge fan of glass screens, small screens that will plug up the carb holes or excuse me, not the carb hole, small screens that will plug up the hole at the bottom of the bowl. Uh, and it almost looks like one of those old school jacks, those things that would come with the bouncy balls that would be made of metal. It would be a tiny glass variation of something that looked like that. Plugs up while still allowing some airflow through the bottom of the hole. Super cool. Um, metal screens. Uh, I, I, whenever I see a metal screen, I always think of Cypress Hill, but whatever I'm talking about, like, uh, like what you should or shouldn't be smoking off of, um, probably shouldn't be inhaling buttloads of heavy metals off of things like metal screens. So if you have the opportunity to change up from that, please do. Speaking of various old school means of smoking, old school smoking would include classic pipes, hand rolls, things like that, of course. And, you know, who can, who can resist that? Pipes exist in every medium and shape. Now, uh, I've seen all sorts of Gandalf pipes. I've had all sorts of pipes. I've broken all sorts of pipes. I've been there. Different qualities of rolling papers and crutches are available. Don't leave home without them. Lots of rolling mediums, cellulose, tobacco, hemp, cones, flavored, so on and so on and so on. Um, I use the thinnest weight paper possible. Would you guys like to hear a crazy, uh, crazy word out of the uh, paper uh, world? Paper is generally all made out of the exact same chemical, the exact same product. It's different weights. And if you guys have ever ordered printing before, you'll know what I mean by weights. Like paper comes in different weight. And the thicker, more high quality generally paper has a thicker, heavier weight. And thinner paper has a lighter weight. When I smoke generally is what's called rice papers, but rice papers are no different than the thicker variations. It's not like they're made from rice or anything. They're not. What the rice papers that you smoke out of are made out of the exact same tree sap based medium that all of the other papers are made out of. It's just a lighter weight. What I smoke is the lightest weight paper available. But it's interesting that of all, out of all the papers and how they're marketed, really for the most part, the only differences are bleached papers versus unbleached like the raws and different weights. And that's fucking it. And everything else is a gimmick. Kind of interesting. Old school smoking, for the most part. There are a few exceptions. Uh, but most, the vast majority of them out there are gimmicks. 
Uh, old school smoking would also include, where were we? Uh, hand rolling machines would be available for easy rolling. Not my favorite. I am a uh, hand roller non-machine. I am the hand rolling machine uh, as long as my hands are working. So for now, we're looking as it going. We can also suggest that a lot of those include, as per the last line, the least healthy ways of ingesting your cannabis. Uh, generally speaking, it's not good for you through a lot of those methods out there. And I'll cover some of that with a little bit more specificity in a moment. Um, for the moment, uh, just to cover some of these next level products here, uh, we've got electronic dab, uh, portable dab rigs. That's one of those Puffco peaks in the top left. Some of you guys might be Carta fans out there. I'm not sure. But if you're familiar with those types of products, basically we've got something that fits in your cup holder eerily enough that is way too convenient to take on the go. And uh, it is the type of product that you're able to maybe take places. Um, that has definitely helped me, you know, uh, enjoy my dabs in many corners of this globe. And uh, when it comes to that level of convenience, that's pretty amazing. Double barrel vape pens. Those are crazy. I don't see those as often anymore, but obviously make an impact. Rolling papers made with 24 karat gold. And that's a thing in case you haven't heard of them. <coughs> hand blown functional glass art that's a pretty amazing thing you can see one like that uh looks like an elbow piece right there that's absolutely insane there's also a joe peters piece on the bottom it looks like again insane pieces um uh stuff like that especially like that joe peters set on the bottom i mean and somewhere in the pocket of 10 to 20 uh, and worth every penny. It's, it's definitely like uh, it, it's definitely a, a serious, uh, a serious collection piece right there or pieces. Um, we're looking at electronic hands-free joint rollers, such as the piece in the bottom left there. I can't recall what they're called. I don't see them used very often, but I've seen them a good number of times and some people swear on them. So uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure they're, they're here to stay. We'll see it some more wearing your cannabis. We're also seeing stuff with things like pendants made from some of these same glass artists. And we're seeing areas where, uh, you know, some of the uh, hemp options are starting to raise. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Uh, so I'm not maybe going to make any friends with this slide, but I'm going to barrel through it just the same. <clears throat> this is the dark side of cannabis science. This is when you start to look at things through the lens where maybe it's not the most healthy. Um, now, that much said, I smoke cannabis personally all day and night. I also try to be as cognizant as possible of the ideas that smoking certain uh, products uh, or in certain fashions, uh, there are going to be different levels of health associated with that. Um, there are certain ways to smoke or take your cannabis that's very damaging and very destructive. And there's certain ways that aren't as damaging. Um, I'm a huge fan of glass. Glass doesn't chemically change when you smoke out of it. The same can't be said, say, of a metal pipe. Um, you guys all smoke out of a metal pipe at one point in your life. I know I had. Uh, those metal pipes have finishes, right? Like they're kind of shiny on the outside mainly, right? Like it's colored, like anodized. We know the type. Then you smoke out of it and things, you know, get a little charred and you wipe off you know, whatever, wherever the char is and the color's not the same. So apparently something sucked away these heavy metals and these colors and these metal finishes. And you're the thing that sucked it away. Like as you were taking that hit, you pulled these really funky chemicals off of these various means of smoking and sucked it right into your body. And that my friends is unhealthy smoking. And the whole point of that little mini rant, beware of these. Standard blunt wraps are over-processed and full of pesticides and heavy metals. It's not to say that every blunt wrap that I've ever test blows the, the doors off of our pesticide and heavy metals test, but the vast majority of blunts that we've tested blow the doors off of our heavy metal and pesticide tests, the vast majority of those out there. The most uh, natural looking ones, those Fronto style wraps, I've also tested some of the high end, you know, most the best selling Fronto wraps. Uh, pesticides look good, the heavy metals blew the fuck out of the doors off of the heavy metals test. It was huge. Uh, five times over cadmium levels for this Fronto wrap, it was insane. Anyhow. 
The contamination within most blunt wraps will take a product from passing to failing. Think about that for a moment. We're taking quite literally some of the cleanest product on planet Earth. With these products, this flour and concentrate has had to pass as at a much more rigorous level of scrutiny than any other products really that you'll ever interface with, including for the most part, pharmaceuticals, food products, um, household products especially, so on and so on and so on. Uh, tobacco products get out of here anyhow uh, with that much said and kind of how the interest of that goes and some of those uh, concerns are that you really do sort of wear a badge of honor when you are smoking something through a clean medium you actually have some of the most uh, clean product on planet earth that you're putting in your body and nothing will take that from you Unless, of course, you wrap it in something that's super harmful and super bad for you, in which case there's a certain irony that's happening right there, right? In which case we're also saying that you're taking one of the cleanest things, wrapping it in one of the dirtiest things. I mean, would you do that with your food and so forth? So do consider some of these uh, concerns as being those that have come from uh, working within the sciences and having that lens by which to look at a lot of these cannabis products and in a lot of cases study them. Non-glass pipes are some of the most harmful means of smoking cannabis. Pieces break off, uh, finishes break off, and they end up in your body, in your lungs in ways that we don't even know what the effects are. We just know that it's not right. Inhaling burnt finishes on wood, metal, and minerals is a bad idea in more ways than we can count. I must be apparently speaking ahead. Smoking is a harmful task, but avoiding these pitfalls will, be make, will make it much less dangerous to make the point. So that's some of the more intense stuff for today's presentation. We have, however, the next topic, regulated products versus illegal products. And we have a few things we're going to talk about here. For the most part, pretty straightforward things, but still might surprise you. Features of regulated products. Compliant packaging with child safety features. Huge to know. A lot of the time, super annoying. Uh, a lot of the time makes me not necessarily feel like the smartest dude when some of these packages outsmart me and I just have to really swallow my pride and read directions. Um, but it's, it happens. It's how it goes. It's how the stuff is supposed to be made. Licensed in batch numbers, detailed labeling, the THC should be specific to a batch. One of the, uh, the classic details of the traditional market is that um, you don't need to test every batch, and so not every batch is always tested. But can, cannabis is very hydrogenous. It's very, it doesn't mix very evenly, even from one side of a batch to another, where you think that it ought to mix, it doesn't. From the same nug, the top to the bottom or the left to the right doesn't match. And in the same jar of cannabis oil or distillate from the top to the bottom, it's never the same. In fact, uh, I'll use that as a quick plug for this Thursday's uh, presentation because on Instagram, we're going to be doing a presentation specific to that, right, to that uh, discussion. We'll get onto that later. Product has undergone testing for label accuracy and safety. That's what we do. That's how it works. Uh, really nothing in a licensed dispensary is able to avoid that. That's why some of that stuff is as expensive as it is, is because these batch sizes have had to get aggreg aggregated down to near insignificant sizes to make sure that every last piece is safe and that there no, is no contamination sneaking through because it's a brand new industry and it was deliberately over-engineered to make sure that for those people participating that every step was being taken to keep those people safe and that eventually as things were further proven understood we would be looking at eventually having those relaxed for what it's worth, it's up to the state. So it's easy enough. We just sort of do what they say and hope they make good decisions on this behalf. And it's a mixed bag. We can talk about that later. Uh, infused products not available over 100 milligrams. It's worth saying that if you walk into a spot and all the edibles are 250 and 500 milligrams, uh, probably not. And there are certain medical products that may be an exception, but that's probably not a medical spot. It's a defined supply chain for tracking. What does that mean? It means if it gets you sick, somebody's accountable. That's really big. 
um, would you consider the following? Going to a restaurant that only exists on the street. Let's say you're outside the Staples Center and you buy and have some bacon wrapped hot dogs and your friend says, hey buddy, you better not eat those. That might not be clean. And then you get sick. And then what does your buddy say? A fucking course you got sick. Like, what did you expect to happen? Like, that's how that works. You ate at an unofficial restaurant. Like, they aren't accountable if they got everybody sick that night. They just don't open for a few weeks or for a while or forever, but they're not accountable. And that's massive. Would you eat at a restaurant that's three times more expensive if it was accountable versus unaccountable? What about two times more expensive? That's about where dispensaries are at, right? Maybe twice as expensive for the sake of accountability and safety. It starts to make sense, you know? There's a defined supply chain for tracking and manufacturers and cultivators must stay within compliance. Everybody, every step of the way has to stay along. Sorry, we're dabbing. That's, that's where I'll be in about 45 minutes. Every store is required to show a license number. Uh, you'll notice some stores are very happy about their license number. Homeboy holding his up, it was once a temporary license, but he's showing the number one license. You're stoked if you got a license. You have millions of dollars that went into obtaining that license. Of course you're stoked on it. Weed Maps uh, is not a viable locator for legal stores. Um, always professionally packaged. Flowers always in jars, seal bag, the child safety thing, again, worth mentioning. Multi-use products are in resealable, child safe packaging. Noting the hours of operation, usually not open anywhere near midnight or all night. And retail locations are all required to have certificates of analysis, which are called COAs. What's a COA? That's what we do as a lab. That's COAs are what we actually make available after testing something to show it's safe. It's their certificate that says it's safe. It's a certificate that it's been analyzed and it has those, those pieces of analysis available more or less for public view, for people, both for people to be able to reference them at the dispensary. The dispensaries have to keep that on hand at all times to just get through all of these kind of things. Why do I bring this up and I blew through the list because maybe a lot of you are like, uh-huh, uh-huh, what's the point? It's because there's a massive number of people when polled who don't actually know if they're actually buying something from a licensed versus a non-licensed dispensary. The vast majority of dispensaries in where we're at, Southern California, are unlicensed. Now, because of that, there are a ton of bad products on the street and a lot of people either don't know the difference between these different types of dispensaries, licensed versus unlicensed and the products that I carry and what those products go through, or they simply understand that everything's legal now, right? And so if somebody's open, they must be legal and whatever they're seeing, they're seeing and just picking stuff up and likely not putting that much thought into it because whatever they came into the store, they found, they picked it up and it was gone. But still those things are a little bit of a blight on doing things the right way. And I say this coming from the traditional market, but also having taken these steps and knowing what's in there. I can also tell you that I, out of everybody and everything that that I test for. It is not that profitable to have to test to this level for all of these uh, cultivators and manufacturers who are participating in the licensed market. To make it this safe, it doesn't make the product uh, this profitable. And so the idea of safe versus not safe just becomes a massive uh, area of distinction and something worth making right here. So something we've unfortunately seen are that a lot of these illegal stores are dumping grounds for unsafe product. There's like this a little bit of an extra area of black market that's come through, which uh, basically simply is that not all product uh, is reported accurately through metric, which is the California system. If something fails, it might end up in one of the traditional or trap stores. That's not necessarily good. That means that the overall uh, level and the opportunity for the, a uh, lot of these products to get out there are sort of raised uh, almost unnaturally beyond what it was before. We haven't seen much of them with the whole COVID-19 thing, of course, but a lot of those seshes that were popping up, 
were dumping grounds. I personally had seen products that had failed uh, at, you know, our lab and saw those products very, very basically redressed at those sessions. And I'm not the police. I'm not the guy blowing the whistle. But it is a little heartbreaking to see something that you know that those, you know, people carrying it knew was contaminated, just simply finding a way out through a different means. That's not necessarily the spirit of going forward and uh, enjoying collectively, enjoying our favorite plant. Moving on though, microbial contamination, massive levels of, uh, of safety kicking in for microbial contamination, heavy metal contamination as well. And see a few of those little fails popping up in terms of like what can possibly go in and out of there. Um, inaccurate labeling and poor homogenization. Now, we mentioned homogenization already once, and it being done poorly is sort of a staple when you don't, and when you're not under the gun to test everything to make sure it's perfect. And there can be hot spots where something could be mixed where there might not be as much product, uh, or maybe too much product. Uh, when I say product, active ingredient is how I should uh, is, is how I should uh, uh, refer to that. Next, residual solvents, pesticides, and plant growth regulators. Now, we're looking at something pretty serious here. PGRs are basically hormones, ones generally regarded, and the ones we're looking at especially, as things that shouldn't be used for plants that are being taken by people. Residual solvents are being studied. Um, obviously, high amounts of certain solvents uh, get pretty bad. Right before the COVID-19 thing happened, uh, there was and this is a story that's only one degree away. Uh, one of my lab manager's friends had picked up uh, a quarter of shatter was how it was being sold uh, from one of those sessions. Uh, rather than had a little bit of buyer's remorse after picking it up, decided not to smoke it. Instead gave our lab uh, the, the uh, amount he had picked up to have tested and just to figure out what he had almost done. Uh, it came back with uh, seven PPMs of benzene. Uh, benzene is one of the most harmful chemicals that we test for whatsoever. And the action level is as low as uh, almost a, uh, of any uh, solvent that could be possible or could be present rather, uh, one PPM. They found seven PPMs, so seven times over the legal limit, the safe limit for benzene. Uh, so seven times over fail, so it shouldn't even show up and seven times over the fail limit is how it came up. Uh, massively unhealthy, um, it, it just, it's just straight up poison and uh, awesome that that person did not smoke it. So again, a dumping ground. So as of uh, April, 2019, LA County uh, started suing uh, some of the illegal stores with harmful chemicals. Of course, we haven't seen too much of that in uh, 2020. Licensing and state systems, I'm just going to blow through this. BCC has licensed lookup tools in place. They're not that good, but they are usable. BCC also has requirements on license info being shown everywhere, in shops, on advertising, et cetera. In fact, most shops have a QR code that's scannable right when you walk in that will go to the BCC site to show that it is a licensed shop. Label requirements are extremely specific, not just the you know, weed leaf exclamation point symbol, the batch number, testing info, and dates are shown. In fact, most non-licensed products still has that symbol. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, you know, the new symbol to say weeds in here. Generally, the state mandates that anything appealing to kids does not make it onto the packaging or into advertising and uncomfortable, yes, but all part of legalization and safety. So we're going to give you a little bit of a taste of what I do, just cannabis product testing, what steps, as long as we've kind of brought them about, things go through, you know, what it means to be a cannabis product, what it means to be tested. And I promise I'm just going to brush through this. Cannabis classes are coming later in this, or excuse me, cannabis testing classes are coming later in this once we've covered a host more different types of uh, processes and will be much more intuitive by the time we get there. This is just kind of the quick intro. So cannabinoids and terpenes, if you've heard of terpenes, are the two best available measurements, measurements being a very key term, of cannabis quality for naturally grown or minimally processed products, such as a high quality extraction. 
it's worth mentioning that if somebody's adding a bunch of terpenes from an alternative botanical source, that obviously you know, they can add as many terpenes as they want. That's not really a high a reading of high quality. But if we see a naturally grown flower, naturally extracted product, in either of those cases, have a massively wild, awesome, robust terpene profile, that's the stuff dreams are made of. So that's what we want to highlight with that idea. It's also worth mentioning that there's not near that terpenes aren't nearly the end all be all. There are going to be ketones, tannins, um, flavonoids, thiols, uh, esters, all sorts of chemicals that create flavor and possibly could be responsible for physiological effects within cannabis that we just don't have the opportunity to really quantify yet. And with the opportunity to quantify those as we go further and further, uh, a lot will, uh, will come to pass. So, cannabinoids and terpenes, both can be measured by an analytical laboratory, such as Bell Coastal Labs. A high-pressure liquid chromatograph, HPLC, is used for the cannabinoids, and a gas chromatograph with flame ionization detector, GCFID, is used for terpenes. A high terpene content, as mentioned, has the greatest bearing in the cannabis being considered high quality. Cannabis safety testing, just to give you, if anybody has any questions about what these instruments are, course, happy to answer them. But as mentioned, this is just an introduction. Label accuracy to test homogeneity in a batch. It's just a different type of potency test. It's all done through HPLC or high pressure liquid chromatograph. Pesticide through an LC mass spectrometer and through a GC mass spectrometer. Microbial test through a qPCR. It's the same thing they would use for forensics uh, or for uh, like a parentage test. Uh, residual solvents, a GCFID, again, with a headspace analyzer, specifically with a mass spectrometer. Um, heavy metals, inductively coupled ma plasma mass spectrometer, an ICPMS, basically capable of getting twice as hot as the sun, raising uh, metals to the temperature of plasma and transitioning them into plasma, and depending on how much transition and at what heats we're able to tell what type of metal we're looking at. Mycotoxins are types of toxins produced by molds, also studied by our LCMS. Moisture content done through a moisture analyzer, which is a specialized type of scale. Water activity through a specialized hygrometer that we can use with a cannabis element. All of that gets used for the sake of testing through different types of tests, different tests, different machines, and all of that stuff is for California compliance testing, which is the whole reason that a lab like mine would exist. Went into effect on January 1st, 2018. All levels of cannabis screening are in effect. More will likely be added. It's probably not over, guys. And it's not going to be easy for anybody. For us, it'll cost massive amounts to be able to onboard those new tests. And it's not something we're looking forward to at all. Cannabis regulation includes the need for all cannabis products to be tested prior to retail and failed batches are allowed to be remediated up to two times. Remediated is a fancy scientific way to say cleaned. The California BCC, who gets to call the shots on all this stuff, focuses heavily on preventing diversion into the black market. So failed batches, you're allowed to clean them. Depending on what the nature of the failure is, there are different types of remediation or different means that may happen. If it's a uh, type of remediation because it failed a moisture activity test, it was too wet. It just may simply need to be dried. That's pretty easy. If it failed because of microbial um, uh, uh, contamination, sorry, or like pesticide, that's much more complex and way more additional steps may need to be taken in order to get it through the whole process. So what can go wrong with cannabis? These are interesting, guys, so pay attention. Pesticide concentration is an inadvertent result of producing concentrated products. So what am I talking about here? What this means is if I make a concentrate, kind of like I'm a big fan of how I showed you my dab rig earlier, right? So if you take those concentrated products, now what you can get here is take some flour that may have passed the California compliance test, but if you concentrate it, what are you doing? You're concentrating the cannabinoids, you're concentrating the terpenes, and you're concentrating other chemicals such as the contaminants as well. And you can actually take a product that would have passed California compliance testing pre-extraction and actually render it unable to pass California testing post-extraction because you concentrated everything, including the bad shit. It's mind-blowing.
let me know if you have any questions on that. But absolutely the truth absolutely happens everywhere. Things like micro extractions, if you're curious, feel free to ask me about them. Uh, otherwise, we'll be covering them in a later class, uh, are starting to become more and more popular for some of these reasons. Early storage and prepackaging can lead to microbial contamination issues, and we see that. Poor homogenization in infused product manufacturing plagues the industry. You need to be able to mix everything well. Um, we're looking at overspray from neighboring crops, common source of pesticide issues, underlying common. I have seen million dollar systems in designed to create positive pressure systems within greenhouses to simply stave off pesticides from neighboring crops wandering in there. Million dollars, for, uh, insane but it happens and it's a massive concern with regards to cannabis being around other agricultural crops. Now see other types of agriculture aren't susceptible to the same levels. Kind of like we discussed before that cannabis is see cannabis is susceptible to really low action levels for certain chemicals and in food products, they may be allowed to have, <clears throat> excuse me, they may be allowed to have some of these same chemicals over in over a thousand times greater concentration. It's just food industry gets treated differently than cannabis industry. It isn't fair, but that is the case. With that much said, and what we're looking at, the amount of pesticides that may be possible to use for a food crop may not be possible to use for a cannabis crop and somebody spraying all day and may not be affecting their, their fruits and vegetables uh, in any way of compliance for their own systems, but will absolutely be, as mentioned before and other things, blowing the doors off of our pesticide tests here. When I test plants at different parts of the property, you can tell what part of the property the pesticides blew in from based on levels of contamination you find in the plants in the direction of the wind. It's, it's absolutely insane. Other issues, uh, vape cartridges can leach heavy metals into cannabis oil, as mentioned earlier, worth reinforcing. So just a couple of ideas, and just to give you a little bit more of a uh, idea of what kind of environment a lab looks like. A lot of instruments, a lot of people working on them, a lot of people busy. Uh, the instruments themselves use gases and solvents. You can see some of the solvents up on top of the instruments in the top left. You can see some of the gases closer to the frame on the bottom right. Most of the instruments we use are mass spectrometers. On the left, you see one of the two phases of lab testing. Now, there are more than that, but to simplify things a bit, lab testing is two main phases. There's prep and then there's analytics or I should say rather instrumentation and the analytics come through instrumentation. Everything is in step one prepped for use as you would see on the left for uh, use in instrumentation. Everything gets prepped, broken down and readied for uh, use in the instruments using all of the appropriate steps within the scientific method, including appropriate uh, weights weighed out, recorded, uh, appropriate amounts of solvent, uh, and appropriate steps necessary uh, when necessary in order to um, uh, help the uh, uh, cannabinoids, terpenes, or any other chemicals we may be searching for uh, dissolve into the solvents or into the mediums that we're using. So you can see a lot of the instruments, again, mainly mass spectrometers here and uh, mainly analytics following the uh, prep of a lot of these, uh, of a lot of these uh, types of instruments. So Kind of neat, another shot of our prep lab, another shot of our instrument lab there on the right. A little bit of a shot of some liquid nitrogen, which we used in some of our prep there behind, uh, used in a very specialized instrument called a cryo mill. So kind of fun, kind of neat. Any questions, guys? I just want to give a huge shout out and give a round of applause. Thank you, Nate, so much for the presentation. If anyone has questions, please feel free to go off mute or drop a comment in the um, chat. And if anything, Thank you all. We appreciate you. There were some questions at the very top from Gene. It says, does the federal government or other states use that classification or just Cali? believe he was talking about the 10 milligrams, the dosing. I'm not 100% sure, though. If, you know, the odds are government stands, uh, stays out of, federal government stays out of any standardizations. Uh, accurate to say it's just Cali, although most other states uh, operate in a very similar way. Uh, 
in especially with regards to uh, uh, you know dosage and serving size. You said inhalant, uh, non-inhalant slash flour. Oh, interesting. Um, so in that sense, it still is just California. Uh, California will have really specific laws and guidelines here specifically when it comes to some of that, uh, more strict than even the rest of the other states in the country. We have the strictest guidelines in California. You had said something about uh, the testing for solvents when you, so there's flour that would have passed previously, but then when you concentrate it, uh, it concentrates the bad stuff. Now it won't pass testing. Yes. Can you unbox that a little bit more? Yeah, happily. So um, the simplest way to put it is that when you make a concentrate, you concentrate things, good things and bad things. And in the instance of concentrating bad things, such as pesticides, uh, mainly pesticides, PGRs would be the ones that we see by far uh, the most, most frequently. Uh, with regards to that, you have the opportunity to concentrate these into unsafe levels. Uh, if you can imagine, and although everything doesn't work uh, exactly like clockwork in this way, if you can imagine there are, a, there are uh, roughly five times or so concentrations of uh, cannabinoids and terpenes from the pre-concentrated form to the post-concentrated form. What you can see is something then even that may be below what a lab's uh, LODs are, which are limits of detection. You may have a chemical that's actually below our LOD in a flower form, but after being concentrated five times over, especially if it's one of the um, a little bit gnarlier, more uh, toxic uh, category one chemicals, you'll end up seeing um, these go from not reaching our LODs to surpassing LODs being available and by state standards, uh, then being in a failable line. What you essentially see then is something in its flower form that would have passed testing, something post extraction that same product essentially failing just by the bend the, uh, by essentially the reduction of plant matter, hence the concentration of other chemicals and rising above the action level, hence into a level it would fail. Awesome. That makes sense. Thank you. And so then there's no difference between the testing that California is using and utilizing like in labs that you're running for, flour versus concentrate. It's just the fact that the extraction process and the concentration process is highlighting, as you said, like those LODs by removing a lot of the actual plant matter. Yeah, the, by the just, you know, what would normally be considered the strength of the extraction and that you're removing that inert plant matter and that you're just concentrating the things that would be dissolved by the solvent and carried over to the next step, usually with a solvent-based extraction. <laughs> What you're inadvertently doing is by doing that, taking over the bad stuff, it's now expressing itself in higher amounts and by no fault of anyone's essentially, it's now in a, in a range where according to the state, it went from being below a certain action level to surpassing that action level, um, hence a fail. So I guess uh, as somebody who is gonna be very cognizant of like what it is that they're taking in or if you're recommending something for like say a cancer patient could you almost argue that concentrations and like any sort of concentrate or solvent or edible for instance would then thereby be possibly cleaner because of the way that it's being tested or the the way that it adjusts the standards sort of it could be. Um, so there are certain conditions, like there would be certain conditions where, let's say, if somebody had a liver condition, you know, uh, an edible that, you know, may or may not be the right solution for somebody who's in that exact state, um, or depending on the uh, delivery of that edible and how it's taken, uh, things to consider. Um, Cancer patients, uh, it becomes more of a question of um, what might be done cannabis-wise that might be part of the cancer treatment. And then in another sense, uh, what that patient might be more susceptible to because of their condition. And both of those things have to be kind of examined separately, but both feed into the final answer. Uh, 
uh, best bet would be something that would, of course, be ultimately clean, but it really does have uh, a lot to do with the person's condition and, again, what they're susceptible to. There are different ways of taking medicine and there are different cancers or different ways that person's body would react. I've, you know, simply spoken, it's a healthy cross between I would need more information and I'm technically not the guy to, to, to give you that info. Uh, I would prefer cannabis uh, specific doctor to, to have more of a hand on that one, especially when it comes down to the question of what type of dosage a person like that should take. Again, condition-based. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. For sure. Um, some of the uh, info will be in the, uh, let me see if I actually have my last slide that I can drop down there. Nate, uh, Daniel has a question. It says, do you think Altria or Philip Morris will eventually control most of the cannabis market in the future? I believe that they have already invested close to $2 billion in Kronos and Canadian Cannabis Company. Of course, the industry is much larger, but do you see this playing out in the future? I see um, largely like the, the boogeyman of big business, uh, of course, is coming into the industry. Fortunately, most of the people that I interface directly with, most of my friends in the industry, most companies I know, most everything, my world and my community in the industry will be almost completely unaffected by this, which probably sounds pretty weird, but let me explain. What we specialize in, what we look at, and what we consider to be is usually and most dominantly the connoisseur market, even if it doesn't feel like it. If you were the kind of person that got a medical wreck at some years ago or found a way to continue taking cannabis on more or less a daily basis like myself, even despite it being illegal, that's some stuff to, to bear in mind. You were already kind of... Um, surrounding yourself within a specific community that was that type of person that would prefer a certain cannabis of a certain level of a certain quality uh, with a certain consistency. With the Philip Morris, big pharma, big business crowd is trying to capture, they're trying to capture the Bud Light crowd of cannabis. Now, generally spoken, I don't know any Bud Light of cannabis smokers. Most people who I smoke with actually care about what they're smoking and care about the method through which they're smoking. They would sit through a class like this because they're interested in cannabis, right? What that essentially spells out then is that it's a different crowd that you'd be speaking to who they're marketing to than this. This is the craft beer crowd. That one over there is the um, Budweiser mass market crowd. By suggesting and by uh, determining the difference between the two, consider these things. I mean, if you smoke flour, do you smoke high-end flour? Philip Morris isn't interested in growing high-end flour. When they are interested in growing high-end flour, they'll do what Anheuser-Busch did with buying out Ballast Point for a billion dollars. They'll find a targeted, you know, craft market company that has some benefit and they'll drum some money into that. But even then, although I'm sure they make some uh, changes to Ballast Point that some purists might not make, it's basically that where they didn't take over and start just dropping their product in there. They respected a certain market and they just wanted to dip their toe in it. That's fine. You know, people in the craft market and people who run businesses in this, they won't have Philip Morris money. They'll have craft beer manufacturer money. When you become that business runner, I would say it's important for you to ask yourself who you want to be within that, within that range. Do you want to be the guy that buys the island or do you want to be the guy that lives comfortably making a product that you're super stoked on making? Both answers are super valuable in my opinion. I'm not here to judge, but it is worth mentioning that those guys and what they're looking for, they're not marketing to anybody who would sit through a class to understand how cannabis professionals think, look at, and talk about cannabis. That's the, you're not you're not their demo, brother. Uh, Joshua asked, "Are palm wraps are king palms?" And I'm I'm just gonna lump in like hemp wrap safe. Hemp wrap safe. A lot of them are testing uh, are testing and having lab results following them. I would ask any hemp wrap company, and usually on their website, they're more than happy to display it readily if they have a certificate of analysis or COA to show their product is safe. Do not accept a COA for just a cannabinoid test. A hemp wrap ought to be showing you pesticide and heavy metals chiefly 
honestly, I couldn't care less about cannabinoids because it's what you're putting in there that should be counting, right? Mm -hmm. But that's just my opinion. You do what you like, but ask for a COA. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone so much. I appreciate every single person who stays till the end. Remember, to guys. in in two weeks, we're going to have an introduction to butt tender training. Tell a friend, follow the LBCA. We also have Behind the Leaf, a full-on cannabis uh, variety show dropping on our YouTube tomorrow. So tune on in, check it out. And thank you, Nate. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you guys for participating. Love you all. Have a great day.